So wintertime is the typical time of the year when stories are told about the fire. So uh, th this one, I, I quite often get into a wee bits of history, and they're, they're generally little short bites, and today may take a little bit longer. And I'm going to start by making a bold statement that I'm going to be talking about a group of people, a culture, if you would, that had they not existed or if history had have changed somewhat in terms of their migrations, that the American Revolution probably would not have been won. Um, and, and in fact, without them, it may not have ever come to be, or at least at the time period, like we're talking the 1776 era. And, and the people I'm talking about, the culture I'm talking about, are the uh, Ulster Scots. In America, they called them the Scots-Irish. And these people, uh, in, in order to understand this theory, and it's not my theory, it's been, it's been uh, proposed by many historians, so, so I'm, I'm tagging on to that. It's just that I buy into the theory. Um, these people were born warriors, and they died warriors. They lived by the sword, they died by the sword. And in order to understand them, and, and back to my statement is how that leads up to um, an, a revolution against the biggest empire in the world hundreds of years later, you have to understand who they were, um, where they came from, and, and how this all came about. And I think, I think you'll find it a fascinating story. I know I do. I'm just going to get a couple more stitches here, and we'll delve into the Scots-Irish. When I say um, uh, where they came from, I'm going to take you way back. I mean, we're going to go way back to 23 AD, and the Roman Empire is vast. They've conquered what we know as England today, and they're going to march north and take Scotland. However, that's not going to be so easy for them. Um, it's not until 83 AD that they take southern Scotland, but they haven't taken the northern part, and they've run into a fierce group of people called the Caledonians. Uh, eventually they retreat. Now it's a bit vague as to why, whether they had pressing problems back at Rome, uh, whether they thought the cost of this battle was um, worth more than the gain they were going to get. So they retreat and they retrench, um, and, but they build the Hadrian Wall, which spans across the, the island and divides modern-day England and modern-day Scotland by a fixed wall, and they entrench below that. Uh, that wall, interestingly enough, if one thinks about it, it creates, uh, it creates an entire barrier that, for one thing, makes the Scots align more with the Irish. Bear in mind, the Scottish coast is only 20 miles from Ireland. You can see each, each other from the different points. Um, so they align more with the Irish. Uh, they develop their own culture, their own uh, anger. They stay Gaelic. Um, their, I think even their rattle in their, in their dialect because of that wall stays. So that is a very brief wee bit of history about the Roman-Scottish interaction of that era. We're going to fast forward to the 13th century, and this fellow, uh, King England by the name of Edward II, he decides he wants Scotland at any cost, and, and he, he, like the Romans, thought it would be relatively easy. He was in for a bit of a surprise because along comes a commoner, and and the, and his name's William Wallace. Uh, now, we're talking an era where people don't follow commoners; they follow kings and princes and what have you, aristocrats. But they don't follow a commoner. But Wallace is able to totally unite the country under the flag of freedom, and he fights a guerrilla-type warfare and frequently outnumbered, and he's very successful in maintaining the integrity and the independence of Scotland. But he's captured in 1305, he's executed, and you'd think that would sort of be the end of it. England will roll over Scotland, it'll all become England, and that'll be the end of the story. But along comes uh, Robert, Robert the Bruce to take William Wallace's place. And, and he's going to carry that flag of freedom. He takes a playbook out of Wallace's uh, uh, method of guerrilla warfare. He's totally outnumbered. It finally culminates in uh, the battle at Bannockburn, where outnumbered two to one, they're able to pinch the entire English army into a small narrow spot between two rivers and essentially annihilate them. And uh, that ends another part of a significant part 
of um, Scottish history and, and towards Scottish independence. So what, what's happening now in Scotland is that they're, they're, I guess one could say they're testing the waters of democracy for the first time. Um, and, and it's not going to be till almost 500 years later that the Declaration of Independence in America is signed. But this is the start of it. This is where it all begins. The final um, thing that happens, I guess, that starts this ball rolling in terms of how we evolved historically, uh, is how the Scots decided to worship God. So 1559, we have um, a preacher who comes along uh, by the name, his name's John Knox. And, and he's a free thinking fellow and he, he, start, he makes a, a, a sermon or a presentation in 1559 where basically he says uh, that in the eyes of God all men are equal. And nobody's ever done this before. I mean, you got popes, you got bishops, you got kings. They're far above the commoner. But, but this gets people thinking, and, and in terms of, uh, if, if you have to answer to anybody, it's not a king or, or some lord, it's, it's Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. And, and while well, the aristocracy, they just can't, they can't cope with this. But we're, we're talking a period in history where the only Catholic, or sorry, the only Christian religion, religion is Catholicism. And it's, it's ripe with corruption. We've got bishops and, and priests that have, <laughs> don't even believe in God. You've got people that are supposedly celibate, fathering dozens of children. You've got the corruption of where the money goes. So the people of Scotland flock to this new religion because they, for, for finally, they have a say in things. They, they get to pick their own ministers. They get to say in, in how that's presented. Their money's gonna stay in their small villages all, all over Scotland instead of being shipped off to Rome and the, and the corrupt uh, Catholic system. So it, it, it is, uh, without a doubt, the start, albeit, as I mentioned, almost 500 years before the American Revolution, of the first democratic thinking people on the planet. So one can say now that the, the seeds of democracy have been planted. Uh, there are a couple of other things that are happening. N number one is England has learned a very hard lesson in how hard the Scots will fight. And that lesson is going to be relearned by the English uh, uh, not too far off in Ireland. And then it's going to be found out again and experienced a few hundred years later in the North American continent during the American Revolution. Uh, but now we've got a new king. So 1603, we've got King James VI, who now is King James I of England, but he still rules as King James VI in Scotland. And, and he's, got a, he, he's got a pet peeve. He hates the Irish, he absolutely hates them. He sees them as barbarians. They're way, way too Catholic for him. And he comes up through a number of schemes. I'm not going to get into that. It's a, it's a long history. But through a number of schemes, he confiscates a whole bunch of Gaelic nobility's uh, Irish land. And this is his opportunity to colonize Ireland with Scots Protestants and Englishmen. And for the first two decades of the 1600s, uh, there's this huge migration of people who move to Ireland, settle it, and, and basically call it home. In, in what is essentially an entirely Catholic country. And, and the story just gets better from there. So 
1641, we see the Irish rebellion starts. They're fed up, they've had enough, they want to drive the Brits and the Scots off their ancestral land, and the war begins. Um, by the end of 1642, about two-thirds of I Ireland Confederation is controlled by the Irish and about a third by the opposition. Uh, 1650 comes along and we get um, Oliver Cromwell who, who comes in because England isn't going to have any more of this and, and they send in it's essentially a slaughter. It's not just military um, assets that, that, that they're targeting, it's a burn, siege, destructive war and war is a bad word to use. Slaughter would be better. At the end of it, um, Ireland's conquered. Um, they've conquered the Irish people and as a result of that all Irish Catholic owned land is seized by the English. Uh, one could see why the English hate the, hate the uh, or, sorry, why the Irish hate the English to this day in some cases. Uh, and, and we also have, it's interesting to note that a lot of the Ulster Scots during this, this campaign actually fought with and for the Irish. Uh, Anyway, I'm about done this bag, and then I'm going to finish up this history where we actually get to the point where um, we get to a migration uh, over the ocean and to the American Revolution. And with that knot, this bag is done. And for those that say I'm long-winded, well, actually, I did a whole bag, and I still got story to tell. So, yeah, there may be some truth to that. But uh, all I'm going to do now is it's finished. Um, it should hold. Uh, see here, get some balls. I don't know how many balls it'll hold. I generally like to carry about eight to ten, and I've got roughly that here. There, there's 10 balls and room for another four or five more. So the last thing I'm going to do with that little bag, so that'll go in my hunting pouch in here with the rest of my kit. Uh, I'm going to walnut dye that. Speaking of walnut dye, last week um, we had another storm day and we made up some walnut dye and dyed the clothes and there's the end results of the two pieces um, that I dyed with walnut dye. They, they turned out pretty good. Anyway, pretty pleased with that. And we still got some dye left over so I'm going to throw that in. Um, but I'm going to get some coffee going here and then get on with my story. These are very turbulent times for old Ireland. So we get into the Willamite Wars, which is 1689 to 1691. And the Jacobites want to restore King James II, uh, who was a Catholic, to power and the Willamites who support William of Orange uh, want him installed as king. So the war is two years long, it's quite bloody, at the end of it the, the, uh, the Willamites win and uh, now we have finally a final stage I should say of migration to Ireland happens in um, uh, 18, sorry, 1671 where there's this huge famine in, in Scotland and tens of thousands of Scots migrate to Ireland into the Ulster, Ulster area, Northern Ireland. Ireland. And, but their troubles aren't over. Um, they got food now, but there's, there's a lot of issues and it basically stems from their religion. So the Church of England's, the state church is the Anglican Church. The Church of Ireland, now that England has conquered it, is the Anglican Church. And these Presbyterian Protestant Scots are going to have nothing to do with this because it's about as close to Catholicism as you can get. And, and they're not going to go back in time. They're right back to John Knox, so hundreds of years before, who's had this people realize the significance of being free and, and free of aristocracy. They're not going to have anything to do with it. And that begins the Nix migration of the Ulster Scots or Scots-Irish, and that's to the Americas. So between 1717 and 1775, we see approximately 200,000 uh, Scots-Irish make their way to, to, to the states, or sorry, not states, they're the American colonies. War breaks out and guess who they're going to fight for? They are fed up with, with kings, they're fed up with England. Um, 
they they love the 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 war drums are beating and the talk of, of an independent nation and a democratic nation where people will have a vote and they're 100% in there. It's interesting, someone, this is fast forwarding a long way, but someone once asked General Robert E. Lee um, what, what he considered the best fighting people uh, during the American um, Civil War. And he didn't hesitate when he answered. He says, the Irish and the Scots. He said, because the Irish have the courage to take a position and the Scots have the audacity to hold it. So that's sort of my wee bit of history for today. And, and I think had not the Scots-Irish been there and fought, because the question has always been, how on earth did George Washington and his revolutionaries defeat the biggest empire in the world? They, and, and England at this time, in, in the, um, the 1770s, was at its height, its height of, of power, its height of uh, monetary, world monetary. It was the strongest navy in the world, the biggest standing army. And I believe that the American Revolution got its roots way back in the, in the uh, 1300s in Scotland. And I think it culminated in that, in that uh, rebellion. And uh, yeah, I think their, their contribution um, um, cannot be underestimated. And I'm gonna find my walnut dye, I'm gonna get this dyed, and I'm gonna get some venison cooking for supper.